All right, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to the uh, St. John's College 40th Annual Marjorie Ward Lecture. Uh, my name is Dr. Jade Weimer, and I'm the Dean of Studies here at St. John's College. I would like to begin by acknowledging that our college is located on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made on these lands, we acknowledge the harms of the past and present, and we commit to moving forward in partnership with our Indigenous neighbours, friends, colleagues, and communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. The Marjorie Ward Lecture is our annual cornerstone event at the college, and we have been fortunate enough to host some terrific speakers in the past, including filmmaker Guy Madden, writer Carol Shields, former WSO maestro Bramwell Tovey, and former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Ovid Mercury. The lecture series was established in 1980 to honor former registrar Marjorie Ward when she retired after serving our college community for nearly 30 years. The focus in these lectures has been on Canadian and often Western Canadian art, literature, music, issues of social justice, and other important topics. For the last few years, we have had a particular focus on Indigenous contributors, such as artist Jamie Isaac, uh, who spoke on the importance of recognition and acknowledgement of Indigenous presence, and journalist Daryl Stranger, an Indigenous journalist formerly of APTN, who discussed the importance of decolonizing journal journalism and using trauma-informed approaches to interviewing. This year, we are absolutely delighted to host Dr. Marsha Anderson, who will speak on the importance of cultural safety and anti-racism in healthcare. Dr. Anderson is Cree Anishinaabe, and she grew up in Winnipeg's North End with roots in Peguis First Nation and Norway House Cree Nation. She practices internal medicine and currently serves as the Vice Dean Indigenous Health, Social Justice and Anti-Racism in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences here at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Anderson has won numerous awards, including the 2022 Doctors Manitoba Physician of the Year Award, the Community Development Award from the Mahatma Gandhi Center of Canada, and the Lieutenant Governor's Award for Excellence in Public Administration. We are thrilled that she has accepted our invitation to deliver the Marjorie Ward Lecture this year on its 40th anniversary. Before I turn things over to Dr. Anderson, I just want to let you all know that the lecture itself will run approximately 45 to 50 minutes, uh, followed by a question and answer period. And following that, I invite you all to join us just outside of the lecture hall in the Galleria uh, for some terrific refreshments provided by our great food staff here at St. John's. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anderson. So, as was mentioned, my name is Marcia Anderson. Um, my dad is a member of Peguis First Nation. That was through his, my grandma, his mom. Through his dad uh, is where the line goes to Norway House Cree Nation. Um, but my grandpa was never reinstated prior to his passing because of the ongoing gender discrimination in the Indian Act, because that was his maternal line that went up to Norway House. So today I am going to talk about cultural safety and anti-racism in healthcare, which requires an intimate relationship between the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences and the healthcare system. For those of you not in healthcare, I would invite you to consider what of this is true in the arenas that you work in as well. So, um, where this talk comes from, or where my thinking comes from, really is our work to update Manitoba's cultural safety training. We've had online asynchronous training since we think the early 2010s. There are people in this room who have done that training. Um, but there were some limitations to the training. Uh, it was, people were actually encouraged to use pseudonyms, so it was anonymous. Um, there was no in-person interactions, 
Uh, and some of the feedback we routinely received was that it wasn't practical or applied enough. And so in our current development of training, we are trying to address some of those concerns. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, um, later in the presentation. But that was kind of the motivation, right? And so Cook uh, and Margaret Lavely, who's one of our elders in residence, has given us this Anishinaabe Moen name for the training, which is Giga Mino Ganawenen Anishinaabek, right? Means we will take good care of the people. I might say to another indigenous person, taking care of people in a good way. And in a good way talks, uh, refers to the heart and the spirit and how we see the full humanity of another. We will have that translated to all the other language groups in Manitoba as well, but that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to train healthcare providers in Manitoba and then also support them to be accountable to take care of our people in a good way. A more technical definition of cultural safety is included here from the First Nations Health Authority in BC. Cultural safety as a concept was initially developed by a Maori nurse in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it was really the application of post-colonial or anti-colonial theory to nursing clinical practice. Um, and as it is expressed in this definition, cultural safety is an outcome of respectful engagement based on recognition of the power imbalances inherent in the health system and the work to address these imbalances. And a couple of things I would pick up on from there is that it is those of us with power in the system who are responsible for recognizing and working to address those imbalances, to actively try to shift power to the person receiving the healthcare. Um, and it is the person receiving the service, the Indigenous person receiving the service, who gets to decide whether it was safe or not. A culturally safe environment results in an environment free of racism and discrimination. And the addition I would make here for further clarification is this is actually not just between the individual provider and patient or person being served. This also requires us to think about structural threats to the safety of people. And so when we think about the imperative for culturally safe care and we think about how this is an environment free of racism and discrimination, we also have to think about the structural and systemic forms of racism that still operate in our environments. Now just so we all have a common understanding of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about racism and anti-racism, this is a definition that I commonly use from uh, Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones, who's a black public health scholar in the United States. Um, she's the former president of the American Public Health Association. And she defines racism as a system of assigning value and structuring opportunity based on the social interpretation of how one looks, what we call race. Now, often when we see this definition, we might automatically go to the person who's being um, oppressed, right? The person who is assigned lower value um, and has structured barriers, right, to opportunity in society. You can think about employment discrimination or housing discrimination for examples of that. But the flip side is actually true. And the flip side is actually the reason why racism exists because some people are racialized in a way that means they're assigned higher value and have structured advantage to opportunity to, and access to power, money, and resources. And that advantage is where resistance to anti-racist change comes from. And so she talks about three steps in the practice of anti-racism. The first of which is naming racism. The second is asking how is racism operating here? 
in this faculty, in this college, in this classroom, in this healthcare team, how is racism operating? And then the third one is organizing and strategizing to act. Now this looks nice and simple up here. The three steps look pretty straightforward. They are in theory, right? In practice, we have to do a lot of work to understand why do people actually not name racism when it's happening, okay? What inhibits the detailed analysis of how racism is operating and what holds back from meaningful action that we can see and judge by more racially just outcomes. So why do we have to have these conversations, right? And so the, the top mural picture is the picture of Brian Sinclair. I want to talk about um, his case much, except to note that he died a preventable death in a Winnipeg emergency room after waiting 34 hours in that waiting room. Okay, there was an inquest into his death. The medical examiner at the time chose not to assess whether or not racism had any impact on it. Joyce Echequan died in 2020. Uh, she was a Cree woman. She died in a Quebec hospital. And the reason that we know about her death is that she live streamed the racist treatment she was receiving from the healthcare providers there, right? And what the live stream didn't show was anyone intervening, right? Blatantly racist things being said, blatantly poor care being given, and nobody on that team or in that setting intervened, right? That is a reality of not naming racism, not organizing and strategizing to act. The difference in that case was the coroner looked and considered racism, and this is a direct quote from her, right? That if Joyce Etchequan were white, she would still be alive. Now, we also have plenty of data that shows what a real and pressing issue racism is in our systems. Race impacts, for example, in this slide, how people are more likely or less likely to get definitive treatment for a heart attack, in this case, cardiac catheterization. We do not have as much data for Indigenous people in Canada, so this example actually looks at black people in the United States. It shows that black women, that intersection of race and gender, are by far the least likely to get referred for appropriate medical treatment according to the guidelines when they're admitted to hospital for a heart attack. The other piece of information there is from the Shared Health uh, Racial Climate Survey. It says that 56% of indigenous, black, and racially marginalized survey respondents who were healthcare workers in this system directly experienced one or more forms of racism in the past year. We are in an unprecedented health workforce crisis right now where institutional betrayal, moral injury, ethical distress are driving some of the burnout and disengagement that we are seeing. And more than half of our workers experience racism in these settings. So we have done some things, right? It's not like we are starting from a blank slate. There has been work done. In the faculty, MIST is um, the acronym for the former cultural safety training. We have a truth and reconciliation action plan. We've signed on to the Scarborough Charter. We have a disruption of all forms of racism policy. There's an EDI policy. There's a prevention of learner mistreatment policy. And there's a respectful work and learning environment policy. And in this context, over half of BIPOC survey respondents ex directly experienced racism in the last year, right? In the health system, similarly, there is not a policy yet, but there is a commitment to disrupting racism data. There's a website for this. Uh, we're collecting now race-based uh, data so that we can measure and show uh, the gaps that are occurring. 
across the different service delivery organizations, there are some truth and reconciliation plans. The Northern Regional Health Authority has an anti-Indigenous racism policy. Similarly, there's respectful work and learning environments. And many people in the system have, have done the former cultural safety training. And so I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves if more than a decade passed between when Brian Sinclair died with significant impacts from anti-Indigenous racism to when Joyce Echequan died, and I realize that was a Quebec death, but there is no reason to think that that death could not have happened here. If more than a decade passed, why haven't we shifted the needle yet when we consider all of these different technical tools we have in place? And I would offer this quite simple maxim that probably many of us know. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Now, when I think about why haven't the things we've done already resulted in measurable improvements in the racially equitable healthcare or learning environments that Indigenous peoples experience, I think that we have under-recognized that what we are actually aiming to do is to fundamentally shift the paradigms of healthcare in Canada, okay? So we can think about a paradigm as a core set of beliefs and assumptions which fashion an organization's view of itself and its environment. If you are not familiar with the history of healthcare in Canada, it would be fair if your working assumption was that the healthcare system that was developed for Indigenous peoples was founded on the same beliefs, same understanding of rights, same recognition of humanity as for non-Indigenous people in the country. You would be wrong though. The health system in Canada, and we think about segregated Indian hospitals, for example, were developed to control and contain the perceived public health risk that Indigenous peoples posed to non-Indigenous people on our homelands. Many of them started as TB sanatoriums. You'll be familiar with the fact that following colonization, we had much higher incidences of TB, and in fact, TB outbreaks was the second most common reason that residential schools were closed, right? The conditions were created for these epidemics as part of the colonial project. And then the Indian hospital system was developed to then control and minimize the risk to settlers to Canada. And so when we think now that we want racially just, equitable, culturally safe care, that is the paradigm that we are trying to shift. So Jerry Johnson, who's an organizational development uh, and culture expert says, when it comes to major strategic change, paradigm shifts are likely to be important and they are obviously the most difficult to, to achieve. Now, one of the reasons for this is that very often we restrict our actions or our interventions to what we see above the surface, right? The way that we say things get done. That's where our strategic commitments, our reconciliation action plans, our anti-racism policies, that's where they are in the visible organizational culture. And any of us who work in an organization or have worked in an organization know that there's also the way things really get done, right? There is all of the elements of culture that are operating below the surface that um, people don't see on the website, but when they start within the first week, this is what they actually can remember, right? This is what they actually learn, not how to make a conquer travel claim, <laughs> this stuff. And these beliefs and shared assumptions often embed and transmit anti-Indigenous stereotypes. 
If you have a chance to look at the In Plain Sight report from BC, for example, they articulate what many of these stereotypes are that influence the health care we receive. The most common one has to do with Indigenous people and alcohol or other substance use. And it results in meaningful and documented experiences of misdiagnosis, lack of intervention, and very real patient harm. Part of how an organization's culture can be understood to be created or maintained are in this cultural web, right? So we've talked about the stories already. Other stories that influence the healthcare people Indigenous people receive are, for example, that we're non-compliant. There's no point sending a referral because we're not going to show up anyways, for example. Not going to take the medication so I don't need to prescribe according to guidelines. There are stories that we don't write down in the charts, but that we tell each other and we code in different language that we use as well. You can think about symbols, uh, rituals and routines, the power structures. And when we think about the power structures, we can think about the formal power structures, what is in the organization chart. But we also have to think about the other power structures that occur along racial lines, along seniority and roles, along gender lines, around um, ability and disability. Those structures, too, influence how the culture is operating and how we are able to shift the culture. And so healthcare is widely recognized to be, to be the organizational cultural type that is called a hierarchy, right? And I would say this is not in and of itself inherently bad. It makes sense to have graduated responsibility for graduated levels of learning. It is important for learner safety. It is also important for patient safety. So when we think about responsibility for, a hierarchical structure can actually be quite important in a healthcare setting. Where it becomes problematic, some people might even say toxic, is when we start to layer on those other power structures. Where it is not safe for a junior person to speak up to a more senior person because they will be framed as insubordinate. Where a racially marginalized employee cannot name racism because they'll be ostracized and framed as not a team player. Okay? And so in these ways, when hierarchy is actually operating as power over, it becomes very harmful. Now, several years back, around uh, 2011 or so, when I was in my first leadership role in the university after joining faculty, I was really surprised to learn that other people don't like change as much as I do, okay? <laughs> my close colleague Melanie McKinnon and I will sometimes tell the story about how our team actually called EAP on us because of the pace and type of change we were pursuing without having built adequate relationships first, right? So we had to have some support to that. It was an important lesson for me to think about, like, why? Like, where is this coming from? And so this is actually from one of my favorite organizational theory books. Uh, and what Bullman says about organizational change is that change alters power relationships and undermines existing agreements and pacts. Even more profoundly, it intrudes on deeply rooted symbolic forms, traditional ways, icons, and rituals. Below the surface, an organization's cultural tapestry begins to unravel, threatening time-honored traditions, prevailing cultural values and ways, and shared meaning. So my own family, as well as myself, has experienced significant harm from racism in the healthcare system. So as an Indigenous woman, when I look at this quote, I find it mostly exciting, right? Because those deeply rooted symbolic forms, the existing agreements and pacts, 
the time-honored traditions, the evidence shows, as well as my personal experience, and literally every other Indigenous person that I know, is that these do not serve us. They were not meant to serve us, and they do not equitably serve us. So of course we want to undo that, right? The flip side, as I mentioned, though, is also true, where if the time-honored traditions um, value and support your career advancement, but the prevailing cultural values and ways reflect your own cultural values and ways, of course threatening to unravel those would be perceived as a personal threat too. And so this is where that resistance to change comes from. Now, from the same book, this table here shows how some of those resistance or how some of those frames of resistance show up, right? And I'll be honest, uh, for I've been in practice for 17 years now in formal leadership roles in the university for 13 years now. I would prefer if I didn't have to deal with these forms of resistance, right? If someone else would do that work. I mean, ideally there wouldn't be any, but that's not reality. But what I have seen is that it is not effective for me to hope someone else will do this work, at least not at this point. And so we have to attend to it. We have to be realistic that when we are talking about things like we want Indigenous people in these positions for very good reasons, that causes some people anxiety because they perceive it as an opportunity or a job threat. When you think about the structural frame and the loss of direction, clarity, confusion, or chaos, if we are saying we want you to take the time that is needed to build a trusting relationship and provide culturally safe care, but all of the healthcare system indicators focus on flow and how quickly people move through the system, we're the ones causing that confusion because then people don't know, well, which is it? Am I supposed to be fast, or am I supposed to take the time to listen, understand that there are all these other power relationships and histories operating in this interaction, and I need to be able to slow down and establish my credibility as a provider in this relationship. In the um, political realm, we think about conflicts between winners and losers. This can absolutely relate to the other ones. Um, think about, for example, unions, right, and seniority hires or other forms of hires, those explicit collective agreements and pacts, right? How does that serve to oppose or advance racially just uh, health care and hiring practices? And then the symbolic frame, right, loss of meaning and purpose or clinging to the past. Part of the way I would understand this is that when I say systemic racism operates in healthcare, and we are all actors in that, and the only way for us to, um, to not contribute to racist outcomes is to be actively anti-racist. What many people hear is you just called me racist. Not what I said, what many people hear, because it challenges how they have seen themselves as a benevolent healthcare provider who treats everybody the same. So there are many different change management models. This is one. Um, in healthcare, we use the LEADS framework quite often. This one talks about things like create urgency, build a coalition, develop a vision, empower others to act, look for those short-term wins. I'm gonna be honest, there's not a lot of short-term wins in paradigm-shifting work, right? Consolidate and anchor change. Models like this, really emphasize change as technical, right? Emphasize the technical aspects of change. Um, and that doesn't work for us, at least not in this scenario. So just a couple quotes about this. The most common leadership failure stems from trying to apply technical solutions to adaptive challenges. This is not to say that technical solutions aren't necessary, right? But as my colleague Dr. Douglas talks about with our anti-racism policy, she talks about it as a launching point. It helps us set the standard. 
The real work now is how do we implement it? How do we leverage that to create the kind of anti-racist change in the faculty that we need to see? That's the adaptive part of the challenge. And Lisa Leahy, who wrote the book Immunity to Change, great book on change, says the technical solution will always, always look like the easier thing to do, whether it works or not. And as leaders, we want to default to this, right? Because we've been trained to think we want the quick win. As leaders, we want to be seen, and our ego is often tied up as being seen as the expert, the one who knows. And that is less possible in paradigm shifting adaptive work. Because the knowledge and the skills that got you to the point of leadership may not be the knowledge and the skills that we need to change the system. Because our system has generally undervalued the type of knowledge and skills we need for adaptive change. So this slide um, is from a really good article on accelerating organizational anti-racism change. A bit of a blog post, he's a consultant. But it builds further on this idea of technical versus adaptive solutions and technical versus adaptive challenges, right? And so in a technical um, challenge, we might say that the root causes are easy to identify. So if you look at the Brian Sinclair inquest, for example, the solutions talked about things like sight lines in the waiting room, right? In an adaptive challenge, the root causes are difficult to identify and easy to deny. Racism had nothing to do with that. What the coroner actually said at the time was Snow White would have died in the emergency room that day, except Snow White didn't die, right? All the other people, many of whom were white, got triaged and received the health care that they needed. Uh, technical challenges often lend themselves to cut and dried solutions. That's why we're so comfortable with them, right? Whereas adaptive challenges require change in beliefs, values, roles, relationships, and approaches to work. When you think about cultural safety and shifting the power balances, right? Shifting those power relationships. That is an adaptive change in how we work. A technical challenge can often be solved by an authority or an expert. I would say I'm pretty well recognized as an anti-racism expert. No one has taken my word, really, on how to do these meaningful changes, right? Me saying this is what needs to happen now has not created that change. Now, this adaptive one here is tricky, right? It says people most impacted by the problem need to do the work of solving it. I'd like to invite you all to a talk we're hosting on Friday over at the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences Bannatine campus, where my good friend Danielle Bain Smith and her colleague Kate Youngblood uh, are going to be talking about unlearning and undoing systemic white supremacy and anti Indigenous racism. Because what they are going to talk about is how they have implemented a way of working where their roles, Danielle is a Metis Dene physician and Kate is a settler, a white settler, PhD, their roles in doing that work are different, right? Um, and so when we frame the problem as a white supremacy or settler colonialism, that helps us to understand whose work is it actually to unpack and disrupt it and to hold people accountable. So that when we talk about Indigenous self-determination in healthcare, those of us who are Indigenous can do our job of advancing our own self-determination and building our solutions in that self-determination. That is um, one of the reasons why I wrestle with how much of addressing resistance is my work as a Cree Anishinaabe woman to do. Because if I'm doing that, I'm not working directly with my communities or my team in advancing our self-determination. Technical challenges require change in just one or a few places that are often contained within organizational boundaries, whereas adaptive changes require change in numerous places, usually across organizational boundaries. Uh, we train people, we train them in service delivery environments that we are not in control of. Those service delivery environments are heavily influenced by both provincial and federal health policy and funding. Right? Multiple arenas of complex change that need to happen. 
The next one says, for technical, people are generally receptive to the technical solution. Whereas when it's an adaptive challenge, people often resist even acknowledging them. And then the last one says, solutions can be implemented quickly, even by edict. Whereas for adaptive challenges, solutions, quote unquote, um, require experiments and new discoveries. They can take a long time to implement and can't be implemented by edict. Trust me, if I could issue an edict and make it so, I would have. My personality type is such that I am very strategic, focused, and executive, right? But that doesn't work. And so we have to think about new ways of doing things. I don't know if you noticed this in the title, I called it an evolving theory of change. This is my current best thinking, informed by my experience, many different organizational um, experts, leadership change management experts, the discussions I have with my team and my colleagues and communities, it's something we're trying out and gonna need to adapt as we go. We will always be evolving when it comes to how we address adaptive challenges. A few years ago, I'm not great at graphic design, but I developed this because there are some really key points about anti-racism change that we needed to understand. One thing that I saw repeatedly was that people thought anti-racism had a finish line. Like, we have a policy, we have a commitment, like aren't we done now? Like haven't we done enough? Um, or they might look at something like um, the closure of the residential schools and be like, well that should be good, you guys should, should go ahead and recover now. But when I read Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, one of the things that he said very clearly, Stamped from the Beginning, the subtitle is The, history, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in the Americas. One of the key things he observed in looking at the history of racist ideas was across time there are dual and dueling forces of anti-racism and racism. There have always been and will always be forces in favor of racial justice. And there will be the backlash. One very concrete example, what the Supreme Court did with affirmative action in college admissions, for example. And so we don't ever get to let our foot off the gas pedal. There is pressure and there is counter pressure. And so that, um, that's why I look, make it like a teeter-totter. The cycles you see at the top, that comes from the Dalai Lama's book, The Art of Happiness, which is a personal learning cycle. It's people learn things, they develop conviction to act, they determine how they're gonna act, and then they actually take action. So when we think about how decisions get made in the faculty or in the healthcare system, mostly they're by votes of majority in boardrooms or, or meeting rooms, for example. And so when we want to make more racially just decisions, we have to move more people along this cycle to the get the point, to the point where they will take action. They will name racism when it's operating in the meeting room. They will vote differently. That's how anti-racist action happens. The flip side is also true, or the other side of the teeter-totter, right? People are in fact coalescing and strategizing on how to maintain the inertia, maintain the status quo. And uh, for folks who aren't aware, for example, we had a group of um, white physicians in Canada write articles and editorials about how our diversity efforts are undermining the medical profession and making it less safe for patients. There's no evidence of that, in case you were wondering. But there is always these counter forces and we need to be mindful of that. And the other piece that we have to keep in mind is when we're talking about what's going on in the boardroom, how does that get captured in the minutes, what does it mean for policy, we're talking about what's happening above the surface. But the same thing is going on with all the below the surface stuff. How are the unwritten rules operating? Are we challenging them? Are we changing them? Are we interrupting the stories that are getting told that are transmitting stereotypes about Indigenous people? We have to be operating at both levels. So this slide I kind of adapted um, from a book called The Heart of Change from Cotter, or I made it up based on some of what I learned in that book. 
And one of the things he talks about is if you want to use education as a tool for change in individuals, it can't just be brain knowledge, right? Like people need to feel something. So they see something, they receive some new information, it changes something in how they feel, and then that develops the motivation for change. And so when we're doing online asynchronous training, this is what we're aiming for, right? Some type of new individual insight and commitment to change. At the same time, we have to think about what is actually gonna hold the space for that individual to behave differently in their environment? What is gonna be the counter pressure to those who would prefer to maintain the status quo because it serves them quite well, right? And so at the organizational cultural level, one thing that we know for sure is that education by itself is not sufficient, right? And so we might think about the structural change, the things like the policies and the stated commitments and the strategies, um, but we also have to weave in this piece around accountability. Because with, uh, without accountability, they stay on the website and don't change anything in the day-to-day -day environments. The missing piece in this for me is in thinking about where does accountability operate? So I'm Vice Dean for Indigenous Health, Social Justice and Anti-Racism in our faculty. Uh, I am responsible for administering the anti-racism policy. Um, complaints about racism generally uh, come to me through a variety of different means. When there is a finding of racism, I am not the person who can hold the other person accountable, right, for behaving differently. Their direct report is, right, not me. I can make findings, I can make recommendations, but if I don't have the support of their department head or dean or program director or what it is, it doesn't mean much at all. And so accountability mostly happens in the team environment, right? And so that is why we need to think more about how does that team function and how do we support team leaders to hold their people accountable. And I really like this quote from Brenda Harrington, uh, who is a black woman and leadership coach in the United States. And one of the things she said, and I think this is part of our key in the adaptive solutions, is what makes the difference is being willing to hold people accountable. Okay, so that top picture there um, is from a, a website describing supportive accountability. And the vertical axis is supportiveness, so high support, low support, and the horizontal axis is accountability, so from low accountability to high accountability. And the most common quadrant that I see when it comes to, culture, to lack of cultural safety or to experiences of racism is total avoidance. I, I wish I were joking, but that is where and how most people are held accountable for racism, right? And obvious, then the other thing that I'll say around this is our accountability models are mostly punitive, right? And the fact that they're mostly punitive are part of the reason why there's the avoidance of it. And one of the most damaging forms of accountability when it comes to this work is selective accountability, right? Because that's part of what creates the confusion and chaos. We said we we're gonna do this, this happened, no one's been held accountable for it. Or when you see the pattern of who is held accountable and who is given a free pass or a slap on the wrist, right? Because what that sends a message about is what is really valued here? Like why did that person get a free pass or a slap on the wrist? So selective accountability is really damaging to the work that we are trying to do. And so other forms of accountability, rather than just punitive accountability, are necessary to help us shift that. The other aspect of the environment uh, that I just want to talk briefly about is the psychological safety of the environment. So Amy Edmondson, um, 
is a, coined this term. She is a highly regarded researcher. And she defines psychological safety as the belief that one will not be punished or humili humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. And so if you can remember what I said about how the hierarchical culture in healthcare often operates, it is very psychologically unsafe. So when we think about, for example, what happened to Joyce Ajaquan and no one intervening, it is possible that nobody saw it as a problem. It is probably more likely that some people saw it as a problem but were afraid to speak up, were afraid to intervene. That is a reflection of the lack of psychological safety in the healthcare environment. In um, the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, uh, Pathways Forward on the Health Workforce, psychological safety in general, but especially psychological safety, cultural safety, and physical safety are recognized as a key path forward. Like we cannot actually fix the health workforce environment or crisis without making the environment more psychologically safe. We also can't make the environment more racially just without making it more psychologically safe. Now there's some overlap here in this two by two table to the one up above. So this has motivation and accountability on the horizontal axis and psychological safety on the vertical axis. And I would say very often people are in the anxiety zone when it comes to anti-racism. So low, or sorry, the apathy zone, low motivation, low safety, right? Or they are in the anxiety zone, high motivation, but low safety. It's not safe for me to speak up and challenge uh, what I see going on here. Several years back, not long after Brian Sinclair's death, uh, I spoke at an emergency room conference locally. And I wanted to understand the audience because it felt pretty risky going in as an Indigenous woman to talk about racism, which is what they had asked me to do. And so I would sent a survey out. And most of the people who filled out the survey were white, most were male, most were physicians. And the vast majority of them saw racism on a regular basis in the emergency room. The most frequent answer about how often was daily or every shift, and the vast majority of them felt unsafe to challenge it, right? And those are the people we often think about having the most environment or most power in the environment, and even they didn't feel safe there, right? So you can imagine what that would be like for a woman, for an indigenous person, for a black queer person, for example, and where we actually want to get to is the learning zone, right? Where there's both high accountability and motivation and high safety. Because that learning zone is where risks can be taken, ideas can be challenged, new things can be tried. And so all of those inform our strategies for change management in our cultural safety and anti-racism training. And I'll just go through, oh, we're doing okay. I'll go through these here briefly. So um, first of all, we are implementing a coach facilitator model. The idea with coaching, I know there's at least one other coach in the room. The idea with coaching is that it is strengths-based it holds the person being coached capable to find their own solutions. When people generate their own solutions, they're more likely to take action on them. So we want to get away from being the expert who gives an answer to the support who holds space for someone to find their own answer and then take action on it. Because of the important role of the team in organizational culture and psychological safety and making change, we are going to encourage as much as possible teams to take the training across roughly the same period of time. Even though it's online and asynchronous, this will provide new information to change conversations 
create some permission for ideas to be challenged, right? As an incentive for this, we will be offering in-person workshops. That's the next point you see over there. And for teams who take the training, say, over the same six or nine months, we would do a team-specific in-person workshop where individuals are supported to build their individual action plans and the team is supported to build a team action plan. I already mentioned the in-person consolidation workshops. This is where much of the work of moving from theory to practice will happen. The fearless organization scan is a tool that is used to measure psychological safety in teams. Uh, in the past year, I became certified in administering it. I hope to have other people in our faculty and our system administer. Um, certified in administering it, because as I mentioned, increasing the psychological safety of teams is critical for this work. Um, with the help of Val Williams and Debbie Beach Ducharme over the past year, uh, we also have done restorative leadership and restorative justice training in our faculty. This is gonna give us a different form of accountability that is grounded in indigenous ways of, of knowing and being. Um, currently, we are in a phase of looking at policies and procedures, building our communities of practice, and thinking about how we socialize these ideas and mobilize the knowledge um, so that people can access these approaches in a more supportive, but also much more highly um, in-depth mode of accountability. We have added anti-racism competencies to performance review forms, and some of them in Reedy will continue to uh, entrench that further. The reason for this is to support accountability conversations, right? Where people who are doing the hard work of anti-racism can be recognized for that, it can be noted as positive, it can help advance their career and leadership trajectories, uh, and people who are not doing enough can be held accountable by their leaders to set targets for the upcoming year, right? Similarly, uh, again, along with Val and Delia Douglas, we have drafted anti-racism and cultural safety competencies with the goal of having them added to leadership positions for new hires. We should be expecting this in our leaders just like we expect other forms of technical expertise or leadership expertise if this is truly the change that we are committed to seeing. And lastly, over the past year, um, I think I probably didn't mention, but I am a certified executive coach as well, and I've done additional training in group and team coaches. I've started group coaching programs for leaders in the Rady faculty, specifically focused on supporting leaders in anti-racism and social justice change. So you can see this is far more than just an online asynchronous training module. We have tried to wrap that around with how we understand this change most likely to happen and how to support people through these adaptive challenges. So I am going to stop there. That's my coaching Instagram page, Coaching and Leadership, if you're interested. Uh, and I would be happy to take a few questions. Well, I might start with a question then. Um, do you know, Dr. Anderson, if some of these kinds of policies are being implemented in the, the curriculum for different kinds of things like medical schools or nursing schools? Are these things being integrated at that level of learning when people enter the profession? We have um, in the medical school a four-year longitudinal Indigenous health course that is grounded in anti-racism and anti-colonialism. Um, each college is quite distinct in terms of its approach to its curriculum implementation. One thing we'll be working on, though, are some faculty-wide competencies that we would expect every graduate to achieve when it comes to anti-racism. And have you noticed that there's been a significant change forward in that progression since, let's say, the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years? I think our learner body is often quite different now, mm -hmm. um, and because you know, for example, our admissions process has been changed in the medical school. That's where my home appointment is. It's the one I'm most familiar with as a physician. Our admissions 
process looks for more social justice and human rights orientation. So for example, what applicants get asked in the multiple mini interview. And then it's reinforced, particularly in the preclinical years. I would just acknowledge though, that that creates a tension when we are admitting people with different social justice values and orientations than what they then see in clinical learning environments or in more senior faculty and staff. And that's part of the adaptive challenge of it. When you start at the curriculum level in the classroom, how does that get supported or how does that get discounted then in the clinical environment? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> The Phil, the Phil Donahue moment. Thank you for that, <laughs> and thank you for all the work. I was really interested in your comments kind of fairly on about kind of moral injury and institutional betrayal mm -hmm. and workplace racism as kind of contributing to the kind of widely acknowledged um, crisis and kind of healthcare delivery. And I just wondered if you had anything more you'd like to um, say about that. Sure. Um, that of itself is like obviously a whole <laughs> other big topic. This really accelerated during the pandemic, right? And one thing you could do if you were interested to see how this may have played out in Manitoba was to see the shift in media between um, the governing political party of the time and what health workers were saying about the policies of the government at the time, right? Because very much initially, one of my public health colleagues is here too. <laughs> Very much initially, it was the sense that we are all in this together. And I'm gonna put aside just for one minute the fact that we were all in the same ocean, we're all in very different boats, right? Based on access to resources to buffer risk. Uh, but there was at least that sense between um, different actors and different parts of the system that we were in this together. And then when the competing tensions started to display themselves, people getting sick of lockdowns, for example, the business implications of the different types of restrictions that we saw, we started to see some divergence where the population and public health impacts were far from the only thing considered and not always the most important factor in how decisions are made. And that created often a sense of institutional betrayal. And so you would look back and you would see letters from the ICU docs, for example, like you have to have our backs here. Like there's too much transmission going on because of the lack of or not sufficient restrictions. Um, and so I would say that was part of the institutional betrayal. When I reflect on some of the elements of ethical distress, and there's been some work on this, a key one for people from black and indigenous communities, for example, were the widening of the gaps that we saw. That we had, I won't speak for everybody here, that many of us did not have the right, did not have access to the power or resources we needed to be able to shift them. And so staying in a system that was not treating our relatives, our communities, et cetera, fairly, caused a lot of ethical distress for people. And like, am I upholding this system and doing more damage than I am doing you know, beneficial by being in the system and advocating internally, trying to provide culturally safe care despite the, the constraints. And so that was an ethical distress that really increased during the pandemic as well. Um, I've worked in healthcare as a chaplain for many years, and I've seen, especially with a lot of the changes and the increasing portfolio a manager has, and I've seen a lot of people get burned out, apathetic, and they're constantly mm -hmm. bringing in new managers. And because um, going back to your comment about the team, do you see that as a very big challenge in terms of? okay, we're starting again uh, to get people in, in the team approach uh, with, with, with the good mm -hmm. work that you're doing. Yeah, so absolutely it can be a challenge. I'd also flip it around and say it's a potential opportunity, right? Because when we have a job vacancy, that gives us the opportunity to look at what knowledge, skills, and experiences do we actually wanna have in that role? 
who might we not have in our team of managers and leaders? Like, who are we not seeing represented? And how do we appropriately value the excellence they would bring in who we hire next? Um, and so I think it can be a challenge in terms of continuity. It can also be an opportunity. And I would just also finish by relating it back to that piece around confusion and chaos. We both have to hire for the knowledge, skills, and experience that we need for this paradigm shifting work. And we have to continually be clear that this is a core expectation of the job and measure and reward it as such. Thanks so much for your talk. I'm thinking about the um, intentional rename of the cultural safety program that you sh shared earlier in your slides. And then linking that to the strategies for change management that you also offered. Um, I'm connecting it to your responses about cultural safety being grounded in post-colonial, anti-colonial thought approaches, theories. Um, so my question, my musing, my, my, my kind of burning reflection at the moment is um, in what ways um, do you see um, um, the important change strategy, change management strategies uh, centering or infusing, maintaining that um, anti-colonial, decolonial, indigenous um, like ways of knowing, being, and doing. And so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that um, you can share a little bit more about how that becomes infused all throughout those various strategies um, at that high level. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the restorative justice approach is probably the most obvious example because those practices originate in different indigenous peoples around the globe. Those theories, those values, the seeing um, of the need to restore the humanity of those who were harmed as well as those who did the harming. Um, I think those are actually really critical and fundamental to where we need to go. Um, when it comes to, for example, the group coaching, uh, I coach in the faculty mixed groups, white people, indigenous people, some black people, some other racially marginalized people. But who I am is the same, right? And I have found a lot of alignment between coaching approaches and things I've been taught by elders and in community, right? And so for one example, I'd mentioned coaching before as strengths-based, holding the person able to solve their own problems. I think about um, an evaluation of a program I did as a pretty junior faculty member. It was called Manitou Ikwe Kagikwe. It was a project that worked with uh, indigenous women who were pregnant and using substances. And the teaching of that name was that the job of the program and the people in it were to remind the women that they already had everything they needed within them to achieve their goals, right, in the, in the program. Um, and there's a link to the teaching of non-interference as well. Non-interference is not no accountability, right? It's a high degree of accountability, but it expects the person will know best how to fulfill their goal, what is needed of them, and to hold themselves accountable too. And so um, because I show up the same way and draw on those teachings, I think that's another example where um, the frame of group coaching uh, is a pretty Western concept, but how we use it can be grounded um, in indigenous ways of knowing and being. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I just had a question about the, the previous slide where you uh, sort of broke down um, how cultural safety training is going beyond just education and all of these other mm -hmm. approaches. Um, 
And my understanding is that's happening in RADI faculty. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to whether that's happening within healthcare organizations or um, regional health authorities? Mm -hmm. um, ways that maybe they're also taking up some of these approaches beyond just education? Yeah. Or is no. that happening at all? So um, we are in a, a partnership with the health system to develop and deliver this training. Um, they will receive the same presentations. Health system representatives have been involved in the working groups that help develop this change management strategy and understand the process of change. Um, the difference is I have some responsibility and mandate in the faculty. I don't have that in the health system. So I'm hoping this argument will be convincing enough that the health system will build on some of the things that have been started, like the shared health commitment to disrupting racism. Um, or even when we think about the fact that we have learners in these environments and restorative approaches that are non-punitive might help across organizational boundaries and across profession types to be a more meaningful form of accountability. My hope is that the way we are laying this out as well as the engagement that we've had with them will mean in some of the areas where maybe they're not doing it yet, they will see the need to start and where they will see they've already started something, maybe can think about it a bit differently or really try to accelerate and amplify the direction. Okay, well thank you so much everyone for joining us this afternoon and uh, an extra special thank you to Dr. Anderson for her uh, fantastic and timely talk.